Welcome back to Day 11, a study in the life of the Apostle Paul. Our title today is Barnabas and Saul Deliver Relief. Our reading will come from Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, every one according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. If you want to have a lively conversation with my side of the family at a gathering, it's not politics or religion that gets the opinions flying. It's asking what the best route is to take on a trip. Fastest versus shortest. Most direct versus most scenic. Open or closed due to construction. On and on it goes. It usually goes something like this. I'm heading back to so-and-so and I'm taking such-and-such. To which someone will retort, Why would you want to go that way? Just go up here and take a right and go down thus far until you see the sign. No, 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 someone else will say. You can't go that way. It takes you way out around. The most direct route, according to the GPS on my car, is... To which someone says, the GPS doesn't know what it's talking about. And we're off to the races, as they say. It seems that finding the most direct route is quite subjective as it pertains to people's preferences. In geometry class, we learned the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. In fact, it's called the Law of Straight Line Principle. Except when you're finding directions, turns out. However, there are times in this world where the best route as it pertains to influence is achieved in ways that aren't always apparent. For instance, there's an old adage, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. On paper, that doesn't compute. But the reality is there's quite a lot of truth in that old saying. Or how about slow and steady wins the race? Well, if you want a good study on adages and wisdom, study Solomon's book of Proverbs. There's wisdom enough and to spare to live in one's life. Tucked away rather nicely in our passage today is going to be one of the keys to opening the door of peace between the Gentiles and the Jews. God is going to accomplish this in a most profound way. How? Well, your first instinct is to say, the great famine. Now, that's partially true. But the result of what that famine brings is what will open the door. It's going to be the relief of those who have what is needed to those who are affected by the Great Famine. Historians record that there were several famines in the first century in that region. In our passage, we are given a time stamp by Luke in Acts 11.28. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius right there, in the days of Claudius. This won't be the fi on the final exam of life, but I'll give you a list of Roman emperors so you'll always have it. Augustus was technically the first Roman emperor, not Julius Caesar. Many scholars declare that Julius Caesar held the title of dictator perpetuo, meaning dictator in perpetuity. They generally agree that it was Augustus that was the first true emperor of Rome. He was emperor when Jesus was born. He ruled from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D. When Tiberius ruled next from 14 A.D. to 37 A.D., it was this Caesar that was stamped on the coin when Jesus said in Matthew 22, 19 through 21, Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Then the decadent and corrupt Caligula reigned as Caesar from 37 A.D. to 41 A.D. 
Then came Claudius, the same Claudius we read here in Acts chapter 11. He reigned from 41 AD to 54 AD. It was this Claudius that Luke tells us in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, when we read, After this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. Then Nero ruled from 54 A.D. to 68 A.D. It was this Caesar that Paul appeals to in Acts chapter 25, verses 10 through 12. But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourselves know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give them up. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Filling out the first century Caesars are Galba, who ruled from 68 to 69 A.D., Otho, who ruled for a mere four months in early A.D. 69, Aulus Vitellus, who ruled for only six months, also in 69 A.D., Vespasian ruled from 69 to 79 A.D., under this Caesar, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. Titus was the next Caesar from 79 to 81. Then Domitian, who is reported to have waged a tremendous persecution upon the first century Christians, and which many believe is a subject of John's revelation as it pertains to the suffering of the Christians that they are enduring. He ruled from 81 to 96 A.D. Nerva and Trajan finish out the last two years of the first century. There you have it. Your history lesson for the day. Now, back to our time stamp. This is rather important to establish because it will have a direct bearing on what Paul is going to write as it pertains to our giving later on. Josephus writes in his Antiquities, Book 20, of Chapter 2, Section 5, that a great famine took place in the fourth year of the reign of Claudius. So, our time stamp is before the year 45 A.D. Much like Joseph in Egypt, the time for prepare for a famine is not in the famine, but before the famine. So it might be reasonable to put this prophecy by Agabus around 43 or 44 A.D., which gives them time to go about and prepare for the famine to come. We read of Barnabas and Saul returning from Jerusalem, having delivered the gifts in Acts 12. The time is around the death of Herod Agrippa, which historians tell us he died in A.D. 44, exactly the way Luke describes in Acts chapter 12, verses 23 through 25. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Paul will write about collections being made in his letters. We look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 through 3. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed to the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Scholars agree that Paul wrote the first letter to Corinth around 57 A.D., a dozen years after this famine we read about earlier in Acts. It is clear that Paul is here in 1 Corinthians 16 establishing a command for regular weekly giving and not just for a famine relief. Now, back to the most direct route spoken of earlier. In chapters 10 and 11 of the book of Acts, the first Gentile conversions take place. Barnabas goes to get Saul in Tarsus because he knows God has given him the task of preaching to the Gentiles. The famine and the resulting relief that they will carry to Jerusalem will include gifts from the Gentiles. At the first opportunity, the Gentiles will help their fellow believers, who by and large in Jerusalem are Jews. 
Perhaps that old adage of the path to the heart goes through the stomach contains more common sense than we realize. Have you found that to be true in your life? And Lord willing, let's meet here again tomorrow and look at another lesson in the life of the Apostle Paul.